well have communion elements ready to um, for when we get to that point in our service. We have, during this season of Lent, today we are in the fifth Sunday of the season of Lent. So we are winding down. Next week will be Palm Sunday, and the following week, Easter. I hope you'll note our various Easter services. We were trying, are trying on Easter Sunday to accommodate everybody who wants to attend an Easter service. So, um, but... We have been talking, our theme has been holy vessels. And we have uh, been in a Lenten season of recovery. And we've been talking about healing. Our uh, focus has been on sea glass or recycled glass as we have been using during this time. And so I invite our folks who are watching from home that you will need your glass pieces and you'll also need the piece of wires that is in your Lenten bag. And those of you who have a Lenten bag, uh, you could do this when you get home. <laughs> but I want to, uh, want to have everybody uh, be ready. Uh, this morning we are joined in our sanctuary by our wonderful musician Susan, our faithful uh, tech crew. Are you a crew, Greg? Greg, he seems like a crew. He's always there when we need him, and we are grateful for that, and we have some of the members of our congregation as we begin gradually to return to worship in our sanctuary. It's good to be together. Let us on this fifth Sunday in Lent lift our praise and worship to our God. Let us continue our Lenten season of recovery as we focus on health as essential to our spiritual lives. The demands of following Jesus are great. He shows us that sometimes we must make extraordinary efforts to move in a new direction. <clears throat> As we consider the health of humanity, we cannot ignore the needs of the very planet that sustains us. We live in increasing chaos of a beleaguered environment and the hoarding of resources. We want to be saved by something or someone else, but we discover this week that we are in the boat with the one who shows us our power to turn it around, to calm the storm. We protect the jewel that is our home, restoring something beautiful from scars of the past. Let us acknowledge our need to restore, repair, renew our holy vessels, especially this holy container of life on which we live, this very planet. Let us pray. Life-giving God, in the beginning you created this universe with a phrase, let it be, and the waters and the dry land, the sky and the creatures were formed. 
You set humanity among these wonders and invited us to care and honor all things. We have not successfully answered that call. Seeing the abundance as a feast that would never end, we gorged ourselves, taking more than we could replenish at a rate that could not be sustained. We're beginning to comprehend the magnitude, beginning to see all the things that cannot just keep going as usual and not have dire consequences. We are frightened, which is partly why we're slow to accept it. But we now are witnesses to the forces of a world more broken than when we inherited it. Water, wind, and wave, fire, drought, and earthquake. That signal it's time to pay attention and make real change. Too often we think there's nothing we can do that change that is required is too great. It all feels overwhelming, and so we look away, sometimes even from the small things that could make a difference for our community. Help us, healer. Show us our ability to chart a different course. Forgive our inaction. Move us to move one step at a time toward greater care for one another. As we pray as Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Know this. Jesus asks us to do hard things, to make changes, knowing we are capable no matter what. We can change in order to heal this planet we call home. The calm of Christ in the storm is available for you, for me, for all. Amen. Now, even though we don't have children with us here in the sanctuary this morning, I know that there are some children watching us online. And so I'm sure you won't mind if we share with them for a moment. You know, I hope that you got a chance to go outside yesterday, the first day of spring. It was a beautiful day. And I happened to be on a walk, and right in front of me were a pine cone and a, a branch of a pine tree that had, had fallen down. And I just wanted to bring those today to share, uh, or to remind us of the wonder and the healing that is possible when we venture outside in nature. You know, it's been a hard year we have shared during this last year as we've been limited, couldn't go to school as we'd like, we weren't always able to get together with our friends, some of our 
sports uh, teams didn't get together, uh, or if they did with great difficulty. And so it's been a, a difficult year. But one of the blessings of this year is we have been able to um, perhaps get outside a little bit more. Scientists and people who know those things say that because we have been working from home, we've been driving less, we haven't been traveling, that it has made a difference in the smog and air pollution, that some of the birds and the wildlife are, are returning to uh, places they once inhabited, which are good things. And I hope that maybe when uh, you had a chance, when you did have a chance to, to get together with family or friends, that you might have done so outside. Maybe you took a hike. Maybe you just uh, enjoyed playing in the backyard or noticing all the things that were going on. For the last couple of weeks here in front uh, of our church door, right outside our church door, the daffodils have been pushing up. And yesterday, for the first time, one bloomed. So you don't want to miss that as you, you head out. But nature has a wonderful way of healing, healing us when we spend time in nature. So I hope that you will take uh, today, at least, and go for a walk or play outside. Notice um, how just being outside is healing for you and for us as adults and for uh, our world. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for creating the beauty of nature and thank you for its healing presence in our lives. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew, the 8th chapter, beginning with the 18th verse. Now, when Jesus saw great crowds around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. A scribe then approached and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. And when he got into the boat, the disciples followed him. A windstorm arose on the sea so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him up saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid, you of little faith? And then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a dead calm. They were amazed, saying, what sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? In your love, make us whole, may we rest in We have a number of our folks who have continued in our 
uh, prayer list. But we this week, I want to lift up especially our search committee here in the congregation. They are hard at work in the process of um, recruiting and searching for your next pastor. And we lift them in prayer in the hard work that they do. We would add once again the Harris family. They have had a number of issues going on. Six-year-old Ashlyn has COVID, and some of the rest of the family has a virus that's not COVID, but they're not feeling well. So please keep them in prayer, as well as the um, victims of violence in Georgia, in our nation, in our world. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Healer of our every ill, especially our fractured creation, we come before you to make our petitions known. Hear our cries for healing of body, mind, and spirit. We know that already you were at work among us, showing us the way to recovery from the toxicities and grief of our time. You remind us that you are in the boat with us in the midst of difficult times. We give you thanks for this path of following you, even when you call us to cross over from one way of life to another. We pray especially for all who are impacted by dwindling resources. We pray that we will continue to learn and see and know how our actions affect others, not just ourselves. We give thanks for the wake-up calls that our young people are sounding, and we pray for the fortitude to move this journey forward alongside them. We give thanks for the courage of activists and educators who help us wake up to this storm and see that we have it within our power to calm that storm, to restore the earth's wholeness. We ask for courage and encouragement to reevaluate how this congregation can join this effort now and into the future. We lift to you all of those prayers that are on our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. At the table of the Lord, darkness and light coexist. It was denial of the light in Jesus that led people to reject and finally murder him. And yet, the darkness did not, has not, and will not overcome the light. We come with more than sufficient evidence of our own flaws and shortcomings. And yet, that darkness has not and will not overcome the light. God promises to us through Jesus Christ is that light always outshines darkness. Love always outlasts sinfulness. Hope wins over despair. Inclusion reaches beyond exclusion, and peace conquers strife. So come to this table in the confidence that you are welcome here and that the gift of light is for you and for me and for all God's children as we remember how Jesus on that night before his death shared this meal with those he loved how he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them and he said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. When you eat this bread, remember me. And after supper, he took the cup. Again, he blessed it and gave it to them and he said, this cup is the new covenant. It's poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we too share that promise 
of light and love through our Lord and Savior. Let us pray. Good morning. It was a little over a year ago that we heard the words coronavirus and COVID-19. At the time, we didn't realize uh, what we were facing, but soon we realized the devastation that this uh, new virus would put upon us. The many things that changed during the last year, the closing of businesses, the loss of jobs, the changes in life, the businesses closing, and most especially the death, over 2.71 million deaths in the world and in our own country over 541,000. Through this all, God has brought us to this day and we sit here and contemplate and hope with that the end is near. Would you join me in praying? Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks and enjoy your grace in our lives. Dear Heavenly Father, you have guided the scientists to miraculously develop new treatments for COVID with free vaccines that are available in the United States right now. We know that you are with us through devastation and through the hopeful recovery from this devastating disease. In thy name we pray. Amen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow We have been focusing on healing during this season of Lent, particularly Jesus' power and authority over disease, disability, and sin that binds the children of God from reaching their full potential. In today's lesson, Matthew makes it clear that the very forces of nature are also under the authority of Jesus as the disciples find themselves in the midst of a storm. For much of scripture, the sea represents calamity. The Israelites weren't really a seafaring people. So the vast Mediterranean Sea to the west and even the smaller seas like Galilee, where the fishermen usually kept their boats close to shore, represented the unknown, the dark deep, the place where the terrible sea monsters waited to devour. The sea was the place from which some people never returned. All we have to do is look back to the first verses of Genesis to see that the sea represents chaos. When God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Darkness, wind, deep, the image of a churning storm. And yet, in the midst of the stormy chaos, God begins to separate things out, bringing light to pierce the darkness, separating the waters and the waters from the land. The creation story is how God begins to bring order out of chaos which becomes a metaphor for the whole biblical story, the story of how God deals with evil, both natural and moral evil. The story of scripture is the story of how God brings the people of God through the waters of evil into a new creation. It's no accident then 
that Matthew preserves this story of Jesus and his disciples on a boat being tossed by an unexpected and violent storm. The chaos rages once again. Rickety boats are swamped by 10-foot waves and are starting to sink. Fear, panic, desperation come over these fishermen who have clearly never experienced this type of storm. Matthew tells us that in the midst of all the chaos, Jesus is in the boat asleep. The disciples, meanwhile, are in a panic. Jesus apparently doesn't sense the chaos, the evil that surrounds them, and so they're concerned. Wake up, they yell over the howling winds. Don't you see that we're dying here? Save us. Jesus wakes up and maybe looks at them for a long moment and then stands and addresses the wind and the waves. Matthew says he rebuked the wind, and the waves until there was calm. Matthew makes it clear Jesus has command over the wind and the waves, over the chaos and calamity, over evil and despair. But as he does so, he asks those in the boat with him, why are you afraid? Have you so little faith? You have to wonder, If the disciples were thinking something like, well, yes, of course we were afraid. We were in a Category 5 storm. We almost died. And then he stands in the boat, raises his hand like Moses over the Red Sea, and the forces of nature obey him. So, yes, we were afraid. In their fear, however, the disciples had forgotten one important fact. Jesus was in the boat with them. They woke Jesus up so he could share in their panic. Jesus, on the other hand, wants them to have faith, not fear. Always remember, I'm in the boat with you, Jesus says, in effect, and I've got this. We've been focusing our attention on healing this season. We've touched on healing our bodies, our minds, our spiritual health, our intellectual health. And today we turn our attention to what it takes to heal our environmental health. For a long time, the church has ignored the environmental crisis. Some even claim the Judeo-Christian tradition is responsible for it, thanks to scriptures such as Genesis that encourage people to subdue the earth. But now we're seeing almost daily the results of humankind's exploitation of the earth and and its resources. The earth is suffering because of our overzealous use of timber and oil, of coal and gas. The air is thick with chemicals and smoke in some areas, making it unsafe to breathe the air much of the year. Streams and rivers are polluted by fertilizer and concentrated waste from factory farming operations. The oceans have floating islands of trash and ongoing sound pumped into the underwater world regularly disrupts the thought processes and migration of whales. Connecting the dots between human exploitation and the health of our planet, it's not hard to recognize our own complicity in the crisis. Yes, we recycle when it's convenient. Some of us compost, we turn off lights, we conserve, we try to walk or bike when we can. But if we're honest, there are also situations in which we close our eyes and ears to the realities all around us, just so we can maintain our own status quo and comfort. Because the issue is huge, and it can be uncomfortable to take responsibility for the brokenness around us. Do you remember when you were a child how it felt to break something? And our first response was to consider hiding the evidence, hoping our parents would never find out. But the reality was then, as it is now, that it's always much better to face up to your wrongdoing, to confess the worst and get it out in the open. Almost always when we do this, the ramifications are not as bad as we assumed they would be. When we deal with our faults and failings in an open and honest way, we learn from our mistakes. We make reparations to the injured party, and we move on a little wiser for the experience. However, when we hide our complicity in a situation that has brought pain, no one learns anything. 
Relationships are hurt by our dishonesty and healing cannot come for anyone, least of all us. I'm troubled by the fact that there are still people who argue against the evidence of global warming and those who may acknowledge it as a fact but claim that humans have no effect on it whatsoever. In a way similar to confessing what you have done to a person you have wronged, we need to own up to our part in the environmental crisis. If we don't take responsibility for what's happening, ar happening around us, then change will not be possible. If we pretend that we don't have anything to do with global warming for much longer, it'll be too late to make a difference for our planet. This is an issue directly connected with our spiritual health and well-being. We cannot be well and whole in a world that is not, especially when we are in some part responsible for making the world as it is. If we compartmentalize our faith and say it only has to do with certain aspects of life but not others, then we're not allowing our faith to have full reign over us, in us, through us. We don't want to be the kind of Christians who come to church on Sunday to worship God and then walk out of the sanctuary not to think about God again until we come back next week. If we're honest, we can't help but make connections between God and every other aspect of our life as difficult and as uncomfortable as this might be sometime, we would not have it any other way. One of the beautiful frustrations of following Jesus is that he does not let us off the hook when it comes to dealing with difficult and uncomfortable issues. When the leper came to Jesus, asking him to be, make him clean, it would have been easy for Jesus to turn away, pretending he hadn't heard the man. But Jesus was not interested in avoiding the leper. Touching the unclean man was not something most people would have done. By touching this leper, Jesus made himself unclean according to the religious laws of the day. But this didn't stop him. He was willing to do whatever it took to bring healing to this man, even if it made his own situation more tenuous. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have to step out of our comfort zone more often than we can stay safely within it. We have to be willing to take our situations that are unjust. We take on situations that are unjust. We have to be willing to confront the roots of brokenness and bring our own hand to heal whatever we can. What would it take to bring healing to this world? What would it take to turn the tide on human overdevelopment so that we can hold out some hope for the future of our planet? Some folks will tell you that people like you and I can't possibly make a difference. They would say that one or two or even a hundred people who care about something are not able to speak loud enough to drown out the voices of those who have vested interests in maintaining the status quo. In the face of this, it would be easier to just step back and stop thinking so hard about the global crisis, about pollution, about toxins, even about our own faith. It's hard to keep thinking about what Jesus might do in a situation or about what your faith requires of you. But reaching into our faith and making it grow is what we need to do if we want that faith to be resilient and sustain us. For our faith to be true and strong, we need to speak up, to act out, to make a difference in any way we can. We need to bring our faith to bear on our lives and in the world. The story from Matthew reminds us that the work of following Jesus is costly. We have a lot of brokenness in our lives that calls for healing, renewal, restoration, perhaps, perhaps nothing more immediate and more important than the healing, renewal, and restoration of our natural resources. Environmental health impacts more than we can imagine. If we work toward recovery of ourselves and our communities but fail to work toward recovery of our environment, we'll find ourselves caught up in constant cycles of destruction. The healing of all creation is intertwined, interdependent. How can we follow the way of Jesus when it comes to environmental health? How can we create something beautiful that will last for generations to come? 
the good news is we can move forward. We can make changes. We can face storms because we are a people led by the healer, the calm in the storm who can offer us faith in the midst of our fear. And so this week, as a symbolic action, we're going to restore some beauty by adding to the beauty of our glass pieces. And so those of you at home or those of you when you, you get home, I invite you to take that piece of wire that was included in your uh, Lenten bag and a piece of your uh, recycled glass and to uh, wrap that wire around to make a, a sort of a pennant that can be hung in a window or perhaps as a necklace. Uh, so, and, and you could put it somewhere as a constant reminder of our role as those who must take care for and contribute to rather than diminish the beauty of this earth. The crowd in the story is amazed at Jesus' connection to the cosmic forces of wind and wave. All things are connected. We are part and parcel of all creation. Rather than dominion, we are to be attuned to all around us. We see the cry of creation everywhere we look, and we must heed the call not to hide in fear, but to work for healing. We are a green chalice congregation, proclaiming we care about our environment. Will you be part of that movement? Can we be open to imagining how we can contribute to the beauty and healing of our environment? If you want to be part of our congregation's efforts in creation care, I invite you to mark it on your friendship register. Or if you're watching us online, to drop us an email or give us a call. No matter how daunting the task before us may be, never forget that Jesus is in the boat with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now go with confidence that we can face the storm with Jesus in the boat, recovering our depth of love for all and our joy of living in this world. May the words of Jesus ring in your ear, follow me. And may the spirit hover, move, and deliver salve to your soul and bring a spring to your step. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.